having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I want to begin by asking you a few questions. We're going to be a little bit interactive today, so I hope you're all awake, had that extra cup of coffee. What are you passionate about? What gets you excited? What gets your blood flowing and your heart pounding? What breathes life into you? I want you to turn to your neighbor, and you each take one minute, so two minutes total, and tell them about what you're passionate about, what gets you excited, what breathes life into you. Go. He walked away. 
While the bear captivated the attention of all the other kids, this bear was not what was exciting to this boy. A few minutes later, I heard my name being called, and I turned to see the little boy on top of a huge rock sculpture, maybe five or six feet high. I don't think he was supposed to be up there, but somehow he got up there. So I went over to him to tell him he needed to come down, and before I could say anything, he yelled out in pure joy, Isn't this the coolest rock you've ever seen? <laughs> now here was this giant bear lying just inches away, and the boy was more interested in this rock. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. How could he find the rock more exciting than the bear? I asked him later about this on the bus ride home, and I discovered that this little boy has a very extensive <coughs> rock collection. And he told me about his love of rocks the whole 45 minutes home. <laughs> he told me about agates, obsidian, granite, sandstone, shale, limestone, quartz. All of these were types of rocks that he had collected over his seven years of life. I asked him, what was it about rocks that he found so interesting, so exciting? And he said, everything. You could tell a lot about rocks by their type, their shape, their color. I think they're just really interesting. This boy knew what he was passionate about. He knew what made him excited. So what are you passionate about? <coughs> what gets you excited? For this boy, it's rocks. For some, it's art in all its many varieties and mediums. Some are passionate about sports. Some are passionate about relationships. Some are passionate about music, reading, physical fitness, quilting, craftsmanship, farming, knitting, cooking, teaching, movies, crocheting, hunting, organizing, baking, preaching. <laughs> Anyone? Any takers? <laughs> what gets you excited? Well, in our gospel today, we see that for Simeon and for Anna, it's a child. But this isn't just any child as we know, this is the child, the one promised long. And when Simeon and Anna meet Jesus, they can't contain their excitement. They have to tell everyone. They get so excited, in fact, that Mary and Joseph are amazed by all of this. We maybe could translate that as Mary and Joseph were a little bit weirded out at how excited these people were at their child. But Simeon is so excited that he starts prophesying and telling everyone about all the things that Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going to redeem Israel. He's going to be a light to the Gentiles. He's going to be the savior of all people. That's a lot of pressure to put on a little child, but this is something that we know will happen, something that Simeon trusts will happen. So why would Simeon and Anna get so excited about this child named Jesus? And I think this brings up the question for us, why do we get excited about some things and not others? Where do our passions come from? I think it comes, at least part of it, it comes down to where we invest the most time and energy. If we weren't passionate about something, we wouldn't spend as much time or energy on that particular thing. And later in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus will teach his disciples this very principle, saying, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure, what you're passionate about, what you value in your heart, your identity, your whole self. 
where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So how many of you in your conversations said that you're passionate about your faith? Your faith gets you really excited. It's okay if it wasn't listed or brought up. And I will confess to you that oftentimes it's hard to get excited about faith. It's hard to be passionate about faith. And there have been many times where I don't really feel all that passionate about it. There are times where my faith doesn't really get me all that excited. And these are times of spiritual dryness, spiritual deserts, is what some people have called them. This is what Martin Luther called unfectum. Can we all say that? Unfectum. Unfectum, which is his word for doubt and despair and loneliness. This is the word that he used to describe these times of when his faith was just really not all that life-giving for him. It was a word that he used when he wasn't sure where God was. And we all experience these times. So what are we to do when we're in the spiritual desert? What are we to do when we're lost in this unfectum? Luther says, the only thing we can do is return to God's Word. Return to hear the promises of God. Now, Simeon and Anna are described as well along in age. Could it be that they experienced some doubt from time to time? Could it be that they weren't always excited or passionate about their faith? <coughs> I think that because they're human, this is absolutely true. I think they did have times where they wondered, God, where are you? And yet we're told that Simeon continued to trust in the promise made to him. The promise that said he would see the Messiah. The promised one bringing salvation to all people. And Simeon clung to this promise. He clung to God's word, even when he probably had times where doubts crept in, where he wondered, I'm getting older. Is God really going to keep his promise? And finally, after years of clinging to the promise of God's word, Simeon saw and experienced the fulfillment of God's word, literally the word of God in the flesh. And it was in this child, Jesus. So what do we do when our faith seems to lack that passion or excitement? When our faith doesn't seem to be giving us life. We return to God's promises. When someone comes to us in a spiritual crisis, we turn them to God's promises. We do what we have been called to do, and that's share God's word, God's promises with each other. We are called to share God's promises to each other that we, that are fulfilled in the coming of this child. We are to remind each other and those around us of God's promises fulfilled through Christ and on the cross and in His resurrection. When we feel overwhelmed and consumed by doubt, we turn to God's Word because though we may stray, God's Word and God's promises do not. So what do we do when we feel overwhelmed by doubt? 
we go to God's word. We go to God's promises. We remind each other of God's love and forgiveness and mercy and grace. We remind each other of the life that is promised in Christ. And because we remind each other of the promises of God, we can shout for joy just like Simeon. My eyes have seen your salvation. We come together to remind each other of these promises. We come together to remind each other that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are free, that we have life. We need to always be reminded of these promises. So turn to your neighbor and tell them they are loved, they are forgiven, they are free, and they have life in Christ. Turn to your neighbor.